May the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. By happenstance, I was born in Los Angeles. We lived in Redondo Beach, which is a very nice part of the city. Um, and there are palm trees and nice houses and people enjoying themselves on the beach. And, um, it was a, a very abundant sort of place to live. Um, and so my childhood image of the wilderness uh, was Death Valley, um, which is, if you're, if you're driving from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, uh, you pretty much have to drive through it. It's, it's these craggy stone mountains um, and, and these dried out lake beds that, that have salt on them. And it, it just looks like the most inhospitable place on the earth. And so like the wilderness still in my head is Death Valley. And so at the start of Lent, um, I sort of always imagine Jesus is going out into this awful, dry, inhospitable place and spending 40 days there. And so he goes out there filled with the Holy Spirit um, and he encounters the devil. Um, and we have to pause at the word devil for just a minute um, because the way that, that that name, that word comes to us um, has gotten a little bit twisted over the centuries. Um, but in Jesus' time, um, this, this word didn't quite mean the guy with the with you know the, the horns and the pitchfork. Um, devil or diablos was a translation in Greek from the Hebrew word Satan um, and S Satan, as we call him. Um, but Satan wasn't the devil with the pitchfork. The, Satan was somebody who actually worked for God um, and went around testing people. Um, probably the most famous test in the Bible is what happens to Job. Um, that's sort of the extreme version of Satan's work. Um, but he's sort of an accuser, kind of a prosecutor type. Um, and so he's poking and prodding at people. And so if we change our image of what's happening, who Jesus was having an encounter with in the wilderness, a little bit, instead of thinking of pure personification of evil in the next to Jesus Christ, if we think of a, a particularly um, zealous prosecutor who's going to try and poke holes in everything that Jesus is about. Um, let's see how that passage turns out for us if we look at it that way. So, first thing that the Diabolos or Satan says to Jesus is, if you are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. I mean, he is hungry after all. So, Jesus responds by quoting scripture. Um, he goes all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy. And I thought I'd read out the passage that he is quoting from. It's in the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you man. Which, he, which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted with, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Okay, so Jesus passes that one. So next, um, Satan decides to show Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, all the glories of being able to rule over whole bunch of people and their possessions. Um, he kind of wants to do Donald Trump on Jesus, but doesn't he? Um, and Jesus' response, again, is to quote scripture. It, we're still in the book of Deuteronomy. We're, we go back a couple of chapters. And I'll read the passage that Jesus is referring to. The Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name alone you shall swear. Do not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who are all around you, because the Lord your God, who is present with you, is a jealous God. So that's what he's alluding to. A jealous God. 
that's not a pretty, pretty picture. But if you think of jealousy being sort of the, the culmination of absolute love, um, not quite in, in the biblical sense, um, then you can sort of understand why I love you so much I don't want anyone else to come between me and you. Then Satan takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. And um, he's, he stopped asking Jesus if you are the Son of God. Um, but what he does is he quotes scripture, because that's what Jesus has been doing. And so the accuser is turning scripture around on Jesus. And he does say, are you the Son of God? I'm sorry about that. And Jesus responds again by quoting scripture back at Satan. Do not put the Lord God to the test, as you tested him at the Massa. You must diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees and his statutes that he commanded you. By the way, the, the psalm that, that Satan quotes is part of the psalm that we sang this morning. Um, so again, all these lessons are very really neat. So Jesus has just been baptized. Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's gone out into the wilderness. Um, and, and God has confirmed in his baptism. He's very pleased with the result. So the accuser is casting doubt on his identity. He keeps repeating, are, if you are the Son of God. I mean, of course he's the Son of God. But it's like, if you are. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, like, it's like poking at that label. Um, and then we have, when that isn't working, the accuser quoting scripture back at Jesus Christ. But Jesus, of course, has the answer. But why is all of this happening at the start of Jesus' ministry? We've had the ceremony of baptism. We've had the control that has been filled with the Holy Spirit. You would think that you'd be ready to just go out there and start healing people and teaching people. And, and doing exactly what he was sent to do. But perhaps the, the, the 40 days in the wilderness are partly a reminder to those people who are going to be witnesses to this story. It's an echo of the time spent in the wilderness by the people of Israel. It's not 40 years this time, it's 40 days. And in scripture, uh, whenever you see the number 40, it usually just means a long time. The number seven is just enough. And 40 is a very long time. So he needs to be out there long enough to sort of make that association between what had happened before in the wilderness and how people were testing the wilderness. And Jesus is also the son of God. He is a human being, so he is God in human form. And so Jesus is going out in the wilderness so that he can endure the sort of tests and temptations that all human beings have had to endure. Um, we may not always respond quite as well as Jesus did. He is the Son of God after all. But this is one of the marks of his humanity is of, of being out in the wilderness and being tempted. Being the, the accuser, the slanderer, the devil, Diablos or Satan. He's all about the death and destruction side of the ark. And Jesus has come to advocate for the light and life and building up side of God's creation. And this all makes sense, and we can nod our heads. But how, how do we get to that place of being able to follow Jesus Christ and respond with the same assurance? that he has, that he is the Son of God, and that we must listen to God and follow God's words, and that we will be taken care of, and we will not be harmed in the process. That's a really, really hard thing to do. And I'm going to go back to my, to my to the vision of Death Valley. It's like my, my original view of this was like, we all have to go out into some kind of death valley and go through trials and fasting and, and coming near death in this process.
process. But maybe that's not really where the wilderness is. Maybe the wilderness is somewhere else. Maybe that because we, we've, we've come from this idea of being in a place of abundance, um, it misleads us into where the wilderness might actually be. Something happened this week at the, at the food bank. Um, I've been helping in the mornings with the, with the setup. And every, every week we've tried out a slight variation on how people are welcomed into the building and registered and, and then sort of taken through the, the process of, of picking up food. And the change that happened this week, again, it's always based on, on response from how things have gone the previous week was to have these blue dividers all the way up the space, dividing the waiting area where people are here from the area where people pick up food. And I thought this was a little bit odd. And so I, I, I asked the, the person who had sort of come with the information, this is how we should do it. I said, why are we doing this? Um, and she said that, well, the, the food bank people all arrived and they were clump. So uh, apparently last week there were close to 100 people who were waiting in this part of the building to pick up the food in that part of the building. Um, and this waiting um, means that there are some people who will get their food much before other people who are further back in the line. And the people who are waiting were seeing the food being taken away from the tables by the people ahead of us. And it was creating tension and uncertainty Fear that by the time their time came to get the food, that there might not be enough. And so the barriers were to help sort of just separate the space and to turn people's attention away from what was being taken away. Um, and I'll, I'll find out on Wednesday how that went, but um, it actually, after it was explained to me, it made a great deal of sense. So people are arriving already with the symbol, well, they're, they're here because they don't have quite enough or may not have quite enough to eat in the coming week. So they've already arrived with a sense of, I don't have enough. I need to have a little bit more. And so they're, they're anxious, um, and they're not in a great place. They might be in a much better place by the time they leave, but there's sort of a limited state here. And then it made me think of all the, the sale notices that I get by email from all the places I've gotten on mailing lists. And inevitably, there's stuff in it that says that the quantities are limited, that the sale will end on Sunday night at midnight. And then I'll get a reminder so that there are only three hours and 52 minutes left in the sale, and I better hurry up. And I was thinking about how my perfectly abundant and happy life is being put into this weird liminal state of like, oh, if I don't, then I won't, and I, you know, I won't get this product, and I won't save the money, or maybe if I wait until the last minute, it'll be sold out, and what am I going to do? And it's, it's anxiety created for no reason whatsoever, other than to just help sell a few more products. And then I thought about job promotions, where there might be five or six people in a particular organization who uh, are vying for the job one level up for somebody who's just left or retired. And the anxiety of like, will I get it? Am I good enough? Um, whose ass do I have to kiss in order to be able to, to get a little bit further ahead in this, in this position? I see when all the people who worry about losing a job, like the people in Oshawa, for example, who have found out that GM's going to close the plant, um, some jobs may be kept for a while, but there's probably a bunch of people wondering, will I be the one to go first? Will the other people go before me? How do I make sure I can stay on as long as possible? Um, again, it's this state of awful anxiety wondering, you know, will, I, will I have enough? Will I make it? Will I be there where I need to be? Will I be able to take care of my family? And then I thought about real estate in Toronto. Um, I just bought a house in Vermont. $32,000. That's less than the cost of a condo parking spot <laughs> in, in Toronto. Um, granted, the house is not in great shape, but I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. But in Toronto, 
There are all these people who would really very much like to have an affordable apartment. And they see the rents going up every year. And they think, well, maybe if I bought something, I could get out of that awful, like, will I be able to pay my rent next year, state. But you can't buy a house unless you make an awful lot of money, or, or a condo unless you make an awful lot of money. So this is the state of like, what, how will I be housed in the long run? Where will I, if I want to get married and have kids, where am I going to raise my kids? I can't do it in a one bedroom apartment. So a lot of people are walking around with this anxiety about their living situation. And it made me think that the wilderness is at Yarden Bloor, and the wilderness is at Yorkdale Mall. And the wilderness is actually what we're walking around in every day. Um, and so the challenge for us is not out in some remote death valley. The challenge for us is how to cope with everything that's around us today. And so the testing is us waking up in the morning and having to go to work and having to take the TTC. Will there be a train on time? Will it get me to the office on time? Um, and so we're, we're living in the state of a perpetual inability to trust that everything is going to be okay this afternoon or tomorrow or next month or next year. So that's where our wilderness is. And I was thinking about that, the Old Testament lesson, where God demands this incredible level of trust. The people have arrived finally, finally, one generation or two generations later, to the land that God has promised them. That they must have, and we know from the stories, they thought over and over again that this was actually never going to happen. But it finally happened. And the first thing that God asks them to do is, as soon as you've got your first crop, turn it over to me. So you've been on the verge of starving. You've been relying on that. And you've been relying on the graciousness of something else to make sure that you're fed. And the moment that you've produced your first harvest, you have to hand it over to somebody else. And I was trying to imagine a food bank visitor having their full bag at the end of the line of tables and they're ready to go home and then somebody standing at the door and saying, please hand over your first jar of peanut butter, your first pot of yogurt, uh, your first onion, and then go out on the street. But you will be taken care of. That's a promise. And how would that go over? How would that go very well? But that is the same promise that God continues to hold out to us. We're, we're being asked to give the first fruits of our labors in our lives back to God. And we have to trust that somehow um, it will, God will provide. That is the test. And our faith needs to be there to make that happen. And for that faith, we have Jesus Christ as our example to show us that you can be in the wilderness and you can be tempted and you can believe in God and everything will turn out for the best. Let's pray that over this Lent we can come closer to being able to accept God's eternal promise of salvation. <coughs> Let's pray that we can emerge from our wilderness certain that it's not our striving or our wanting that will satisfy us, but a complete surrender to God. Let's pray that we can come to appreciate that through His Son, Jesus Christ, God can truly feed us, protect us, and show us the glory of God.